Morrell. I'm with Morrell's Pharmaceuticals. And as you can see here, I get the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Caitlin Weiner, who is full of awesome personality. Um, and she will be presenting No Golden Slumber, Electrographic Status of Lepticus of Sleep. She's out of Austin. She's a fellow Texan like me. And she is with uh, Neurology Consultants of Austin and brings us extensive experience and anecdotes as well. So without further ado, I'd like to present Dr. Kate Levier. Hi everybody and welcome. Thank you so much and thank you so much to, for um, the Epilepsy Expo for inviting me. I really appreciate being here. Um, so I will say this name is an homage to my father who is also an epileptologist um, and his favorite band is the Beatles. And so that's how I got this name from their, from their song, um, Golden Slumbers. And so when we're talking about um, electrographic sass, epileptic is asleep, throughout this um, presentation, I'm gonna call it ESIS. Um, so when you hear that, that's what we're talking about. It's just the condensed version of it so that we don't have to say that because it gets to be a mouthful. All right, if anybody has questions during this, I want this to be a very kind of informal thing too. If you have questions about a slide, just raise your hand, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, you can save them to the end and we'll answer all those questions then, okay? Can you guys see, you're good? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. So to start off with the basics of sleep, so that we understand exactly how we get to electrographic status epileptic as a sleep. So there are five stages of sleep, wakefulness, in one, in two, in three, and REM. 75% of our sleep is spent in non-rapid eye movement, so that's this REM is the rapid eye movement sleep. So in stages one through three, um, with the majority spent in in two. And we're gonna talk about what exactly each one of these things means every, as we go on. We go through about four to six sleep cycles every single night, and our sleep cycles actually vary throughout the evening. About 90 minutes on average in each sleep cycle, but it changes throughout the course of the day. So what you see is that as we sleep, the time spent in each part of sleep actually changes. So our sleep cycles condense, and we spend more and more time in REM sleep as the night goes on. So you're faster into REM sleep as you keep going through sleep cycles. So this is like why your mom always told you it was really important to get a full eight to 10 hours of sleep every night. This is actually why, because we get the most restorative sleep here in the very early hours of the morning. So you're looking in that like three to 7 a.m. portion for most of us, if you go to bed around like nine or 10. And that's really where you wanna hit, because this is where we get the most memory consolidation and all of the things that we want to have happen during our sleep. So it's, that's why it's so important for us to keep going on throughout the night and really get those condensed sleep cycles. Now, when we look at what makes each aspect of our sleep different, um, it's actually the features of what we see. So this is what's important for us in epilepsy when we're looking at sleep and exactly what is each part of our sleep. In our awake state, it's actually fairly low amplitude. There's lots going on. It's very desynchronized, meaning different parts of the brain are doing very different things. So if you've ever read your EEG report and you'll read about an anterior to posterior gradient on there, this is what we're talking about. The front part of the brain is actually working completely differently than the back part of the brain. And that's what's supposed to happen because each part of our brain has a very different function that's most important when we're awake and much less important when we're asleep. As we start to get drowsy, we start to see more synchronized movement. So between the waves and our brain, right? So we're starting to see more synchronized waves happening. Then when you get into N1, you start to have what are called vertex waves. That's kind of one of the hallmarks for us that you have come into the first stages of sleep. Then as we get into N2, you get more vertex waves followed by K complexes and then also sleep spindles. And I'm gonna have some images for you guys in just a minute, kind of looking at all these hallmarks of sleep. Then we get to slow wave sleep. Now these are the ones that are kind of the ones that we're looking for the most, especially in two and slow wave sleep when we're talking about ESIS. And the reason is, is because you'll get these nice, just huge slow waves, the nice really restorative sleep that we're getting to, and then you get to REM sleep. And REM sleep actually looks very, very similar to awake. Sometimes if you were to put them next to each other, you may not actually know which one is which, except that when we're awake, we see eye blinks and muscle movement, and we don't when you're in REM sleep. So sometimes that's that's the only thing we can look for to know that you're actually asleep versus awake. And so you're looking mostly for eye blinks. So can you guys see those? They're small and I'm sorry. 
they looked better on my computer. Um, okay, so when we talk about drowsiness, you start to see there's not a lot of muscle artifact. Muscle artifact is really, really sharp and looks almost like a picket fence sometimes. You'll see like these lines on there and we'll get some examples of those um, as well. So you can see everything's kind of starting to slow down. As you come into N1, which is the first stage, we start to see these rolling eye movements. You can see those here. And the reason that we can actually tell what's happening and what the eyes are doing when we're sleeping is because of the polarization of the eyes themselves. So our retina and our cornea here actually have different polarization. When we close our eyes, our eyes roll upwards um, and it causes then the retina to be read differently because no retina is normally sitting right back here. So when we read that off of the frontal leads then it's gonna look a little bit different. Here, what we're seeing is the retina actually shifting from side to side. And so we get to see the negativity from the retina shifting from side to side. And these are called slow rolling eye movements. And that's what we see as opposed to in the rapid, they're moving back and forth much like they do when we're awake. When we get into our more delta frequencies, these you'll start to see some really nice sleep spindles here. And they're just these very, very nice regulated very synchronous. In little kids, they are not synchronous and that's considered normal. Their brains don't talk to each other in the same way, the sides of the brains don't talk to each other in the same way that adults do. So that's considered normal. But for once you hit about two, we need them to be synchronous. And that's because the brain should be mature enough to have that synchronicity. Here, you can see this nice, just nice rolling high voltage. You get a fading out of the K-complexes and the sleep spindles as you move from N2 sleep into N3 sleep. So that's also something we're looking for. Now, if you have spindles still, that's still considered normal. And the reason that's still normal is because you can retain from the one ahead of you in terms of the stages, but you shouldn't have something from the one that's coming next, if that makes sense. So if you are in N1 sleep, we shouldn't see spindles. It's too far into the sleep you then have moved into N2 sleep. So we can hold on to some of those, and every now and then you'll see vertex waves in there, and that's because we actually move between these stages um, throughout the night. Now, if you look at this, this is awake. So those are those really fast kind of pickety fence looking muscle movements that you see here. This right here, do you guys see that big V coming down? That's an eye blink. So that's how we know that this person is awake. Just by looking at it alone, without even looking at all the frequencies and counting them, then REM, you can see it's all still pretty fast. You have all these nice alpha rhythms down here, just like you do right here. Um, this is your posterior dominant rhythm. So if you read about that on your EEG, that's what we're talking about. Best seen when the eyes are closed, but it comes out really nicely in this image as well. And so what we do is then that's actually how we know kind of the restorative sleep. When we talk about like a lot of the sleep movement disorders, a lot of them happen in REM sleep because your brain actually looks like it's awake, even though it's not. Now, what happens internally when we fall asleep? We have sleep promoting and wake promoting. So what happens, it's actually all the same receptors, all the same neurons. It's about whether or not they're active or not. So when we're in our sleep promoting, you get activation of GABA, which is inhibitory um, receptors. These are gonna favor being asleep. The neurons in the hypothalamus release your GABA, and that's gonna inhibit your wake promoting. So really, sleep is the absence of the wake activity. Um, and so your baseline is actually awake. So for people who have brainstem injuries or thalamic injuries, sometimes when we put their EEG on, we know they're not awake in the sense that they look like they're in a coma, but yet their brain looks like they're awake. Sometimes you'll hear that called alpha coma, um, and that's what it is. It's basically none of the inactivation for, that you get when you fall asleep has happened, so you're stuck in a wake phase. And it's only for your neurons, even though your body itself may not know it's awake, your brain is. We also get adenosine, which also inhibits your wake-promoting neurons in different parts of the brain. So you have multiple parts of the brain that are involved, all getting this input from different areas of the brainstem to put you to sleep. As opposed to in your wake promoting, you have all the ones that we've probably heard of, acetylcholine, dopamine, that's the one that like makes you happy when they talk about addiction and how we get addicted to things, serotonin, very important in depression and anxiety, um, histamine, and then hypocretin. So when we talk about hypocretin, then that one's actually very important in narcolepsy. So you hear them testing that too when we talk about that because that's one of the sleep malfunctions, right? And then we get cortical release, it's highest during your wake, um, and then also during REM sleep. So components of our sleep actually also look like wakefulness. So what happens when it goes wrong? The question, and really the answer to that, is a little bit convoluted. 
So when we talk about ESIS, we know that there's hyperactivation of the thalamic modulating oscillatory rhythms. So we basically, down here in our brain stem, which is the most primitive part of our brain, there's a constant signal that comes up. And if you read about how like the VNSs work, if you guys have talked to them at all, that's part of what it's acting on, is using those kind of standard oscillating rhythms that come up from those primitive parts of our brain to make sure that our brain is awake and doing everything it's supposed to be doing, then sometimes those can get kind of read wrong. And that's one of the theories to how we get epilepsy, right? Is that those seizures are a little bit aberrant and when they shouldn't be there. So the oscillatory rhythms are very important for our brain in terms of its kind of resting state, where are we? But then we also get these thalamic neurons that are typically providing inhibition. Um, and you have one that provides inhibition and one that provides excitation coming from different parts of the thalamus. It's the, the interplay between the two of these that then helps that oscillatory rhythm of the thalamus. So brain stems driving some of the cortex, thalamus driving the rest of the cortex. The thalamus is very, very important in sleep and sleep promotion. That's where a lot of those sleep spindles, all that, that's coming from those parts of the brain. So then what do we get? It's a change from physiologic, what should be happening, to pathologic when it's now malfunctioning. So something about it has caused this switch where it should be inhibition due to GABA A receptors and it somehow switches to GABA B. Something's gone wrong when it shouldn't have. And that's one of the theories on how we end up with ESIS is that it's now getting the wrong type of inhibition and because of that it's leading to malfunction of those neurons. And functional imaging has actually implicated the prefrontal cortex which is this part kind of right here. So we have those big areas in our brain with those big deep fissures in them, right? Then we have the parasylvian, which is going to be right around the sylvian fissure, which kind of lays right here around your ears. Um, the cingulate gyrus, which is way deep down in the middle of your brain. And then the thalamus, which is run kind of right behind your brains. And if you've ever looked at an MRI, curls around like this. The definition of ESIS has changed a lot over time. Um, it's always been kind of right around the same idea, but it has changed with time. It's significant increase in epileptiform discharges in sleep. That is now the current recognized International League Against Epilepsy definition of ESIS. So what you can see, this is what your sleep should look like, and this is what it looks like in ESIS. So what you're seeing is these huge, these are all spike and wave discharges, that's epileptiform activity when it shouldn't be. So you've lost some of this normal sleep architecture that you should have. So you're now not getting those nice slow wave sleeps like you should, and instead we've interrupted the pattern. So about one third of patients with ESIS will have seizures out of sleep. That's often how they first come to us, is that they come to pediatric neurology because they've had a seizure. Um, it may have been at a, you know, a birthday party, sleepover, may have been that the family noticed it because they heard something in the room and they went and the kid was seizing. And this often will sometimes, uh, you'll be told, oh, it, maybe it's Rolandic epilepsy. That's one of the other ones that was a sleep promoting one. So Rolandic epilepsy is different than ESIS when we look at the EEG. Those kids have little spikes, but it's not dominated like that previous image was. The sleep then leads to this increased frequency in epileptiform discharges. When we're awake, we have better control over our neurons. When we fall asleep, we don't have as good of control over our neurons. And that's true for everyone, whether you have epilepsy or not. Yes? Can VRR Yes. No. Most likely, yes. Now, it may have looked like benign Rolandic at first, and it can evolve into ESIS, but they can't exist simultaneously. Yeah, and so sometimes we may do an EEG very early on in a kid's process and say, well, this looks like this. And then we may say, gosh, you know, something else has now changed. And when we talk about the two kind of clinical syndromes of ESIS, we'll talk about kind of what happens with that too. Yeah. It's most common during your non uh, rapid eye movement sleep, so the N1 through N3, most common in slow wave sleep. Um, and alertness during wakefulness is often affected. So, much like when you hear about absence epilepsy, can be misdiagnosed. Yes? Uh, how often are you seeing high spike wave, spike wave index while people are awake? Ah, that's a great, we're going to get there. Okay. Don't worry, I got you. Um, yeah, that's coming. <laughs> so, so, yeah, but what we see is that your alertness is also you know, not doing what it's supposed to, which makes sense, right? If you're not getting that nice restorative sleep like you should, of course, when you're awake, you now don't feel as good as you should have. All right, so you'll hear kind of two big clinical names that are parts of ESIS, okay? 
continuous spike wave um, in slow wave sleep, or CSWS, um, and then landau Kleffner. And I'm going to address landau Kleffner next. So first, we're going to start with CSWS. The kids with CSWS typically have a more global regression. When we talk about landau Kleffner, it's going to be language specific. These are kids who are now losing motor function as well. Um, they may be having fine motor problems. They're also having language regression. There's a kind of an overall step backwards. And we're going to talk about how this relates to autism too and how we can tell the difference between the two because I think that's also something, especially in the really, really little kids with ESIS, that can become problematic. Um, these kids often have a much more problematic <coughs> epilepsy in comparison to the kids with landau Kleffner. Um, they up to 80% um, are having seizures out of sleep, which is not necessarily true with the landau Kleffner kids. 70% um, are having multiple seizures a day during wakefulness as well. Um, and it is considered to represent about half of a percent of all children with epilepsy have continuous spike wave in sleep. Um, the EEG focus is typically considered to be the frontal lobe and the frontotemporal region. So we're talking about here and here. Um, and then the mean age of onset is between four and eight. And that's kind of true for all of these. You'll see it drops down to as low as two um, and can go up to around 10. But really we're looking at that kind of early elementary school age kids when this is most commonly presenting. There is a slight male predominance to this, but it is really, really close, almost even. Um, there is also, we see the spike wave activity should occupy. Now, this is where we get into those old definitions of things. We used to say it needs to be 85% or more of your sleep. But what we were seeing is that there were kids that they were calling near CSWS who really looked exactly like the other kids. And really, why were we making that distinction? If you don't have a very high spike burden during the day, but you have a very high spike burden at night, then you're kind of stuck in this category. So we've really kind of broadened the definitions to kind of capture more of those kids who are absolutely having regression in these settings, but yet they maybe don't meet that 85% criteria. Um, and then during wakefulness, these kids are often having focal or multifocal spikes, um, as well in these bursts, and they have much more um, neurocognitive regression. This is often seen first in school settings um, for these kids, because they may not have as clear of it in other ones. Now, the interesting thing about the CSWS kids, and this is where they change from the autistic kids, is that 62 to 74 percent of them were neurocognitively normal. So they were totally normal up until the time that they were in that four to eight range and all of a sudden they started having regression. That's a little late compared to the autistic kids. We tend to see those kids starting to regress in the two to three range and again it gets convoluted because they also are having global regressions, right? Um, and then this is very rare in less than two and we really don't see it above about 12 years of age. That's when you start to fall into some of the other categories like Linux Gesto. Landau Kleffner, is, you'll also hear it called um, uh, acquired epileptic aphasia. That's another name for it. Um, it is considered an acquired auditory agnosia as well. Um, and so it's not just, it was initially thought to be just speech production, but it's not. It's also understanding what you're hearing. So they have a comprehension problem as well. So it's expressive and receptive language regression. Um, they lose their function. It's completely limited to language. So these are not children who are having motor regressions as well. Um, it's pure language regression. Regression. Um, they tend to have fewer seizures. Theirs is in the posterior temporal region. So they're really sitting much lower without that frontal involvement, which makes sense if we think about them regressing, right? If you don't have frontal lobe involvement, you're going to have less regression. It's really sitting right where your language reception is and expression is, right here in Broca and Wernicke's. The peak age of onset is between four and five. So there's a lot of crossover between the two. Seizure types in ESIS is basically any of them. Right? And that's what makes it kind of fun, um, is that we can't tell parents, like, this is what you should be looking for. Because it could be a generalized, it could be atonic, those are the drop seizures. It could be absent. Um, that one might be picked up by the, the teachers first um, because it can be kind of hard. They can have focal with and without retained awareness. Um, one of my patients actually carries a little card with her, and it's adorable because it says, I'm having a seizure and cannot talk because she is totally 100% aware, but she cannot speak during it. And so nobody knows because she's poking you and she can't tell you what's wrong. So she'll pull out this card, show it to the teachers. Um, and she actually asked me if I was going to mention her in this talk, and I told her I was. So, so I have met my, my responsibility now. You can see the hyperkinetic, those are frontal seizures. You'll hear in the nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsies, they'll have hyperkinetic seizures. They sit up out of bed, they look awake, 
they're not. Um, and they start just doing things. They look like they may be trying to get out of the bed, but it's all this non-purposeful, hyperkinetic, very active looking movement, and then they lay down and go back to sleep. You can see um, autonomic seizures. You'll hear about these too if you ever read about Paniotopolis syndrome, which is a very rare genetic, um, I'm sorry, pediatric epilepsy, where they get pale. Um, they may turn purple here. They can get hot and sweaty. Some of the kids will vomit. Um, they get dizzy and then it goes away. These seizures are scary because they're awake and alert and can tell you what's happening, yet they have no control over them and they can last for hours. Um, and so that one is really bothersome to kids. And these can all come with and without auras because the aura is all dependent on where the seizures are starting. So should we be doing neuroimaging in ESIS? And that has been really the change in what we're doing nowadays in comparison to what we were doing before. It really varies when you look at the studies, but the reality is, is we are learning so much more about what we, what we don't know, I guess is the way to phrase that. We see abnormalities in imaging in up to 89%. And that's true even, we think about the generalized epilepsies as not having lesional issues, but we're learning more and more that that's not necessarily true. And for a lot of these kids too, we can see the lesions from frequent seizures in the temporal lobe, and you get scarring in the temporal lobe they talk about that a lot with the kids who have GEFS Plus, for example, which is the generalized epilepsy with febrile seizures, um, that as they keep having seizures, it scars the temporal lobe because those neurons eventually stop functioning. It creates a little scar in that region. We see cortical malformations in up to 25%. So those are going to be like your cortical dysplasias, your heterotopias, so abnormal brain formation, as opposed to your myelination, which is that fatty covering that gets laid down on your neurons. Um, and so you can have abnormal myelination. When we say abnormal, it's always delayed myelination. You can't be too myelinated, but you can have not enough myelination, but we don't get over myelination in the brain. Um, and then we see early developmental lesions, and a lot of those really fall into some of those cortical malformations, but they consider the early developmental lesions too, like the holoprosencephalies, the lisencephalies. These are ones that happened before your brain really started to form, and they just didn't form properly after that. UCLA did a beautiful study on ESIS. Um, they had 102 kids who met the diagnosis. 18 of those were actually diagnosed with Landau-Kleffner. What they saw, and this is where it kind of gets a little convoluted and we'll start talking about that. They did not see a lot of neuroimaging abnormalities. But the reality is, is now as we've gone back, we see more and more. Part of that is because we've gotten better. Um, our MRI technology has gotten better. We're better at finding them. We're using functional MRIs. We're using PETs and specs, MEGs, all these things that we weren't using before. So that's where I think part of this data comes from too, is that back 20 years ago, we weren't as good at finding things as we are now. Um, children with, uh, the, without the spike wave index of greater than 50 were more likely to be associated with their global developmental regression. So these are the kids, right? When we're talking about the CSWS kids, who it's really huge percentages of their night that's taken up by that abnormal um, electricity, then they are the ones who are more likely to have the, the developmental disturbances. Children with the generalized discharges were also more likely to have the global regression than those with focal abnormalities, which makes sense, right? Yes? Have you seen any link with scarring malformation and ESCS? There is not. We do not have that yet. Okay. Yeah. But that's a great question because, right, brainstem involvement, if your brainstem's a little saggy, sinky down in there and getting compressed a little bit, would it be more likely? I would say, why not? Right? We just don't have a lot of that data. <laughs> Interestingly enough, in a lot of the epilepsy data, the Chiari malformations aren't mentioned as one of the abnormalities because um, it, it's so much focused on the parenchyma itself that we kind of forget about the brainstem in the middle. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what they concluded was that the prognosis in landau Kleffner was likely to be better than CSWS and that really these shouldn't be thought of as a continuum of each other, but really branches. And so that was one of, this was one of the first studies to talk about that. The ESIS is the big category, right? And really we should be breaking them down into two branches off of ESIS and not that ESIS is a continuum and you could be on the low end of the continuum or you could be on the higher end of the continuum because they really do look completely different and what we do about them is completely different. So one proposed um, is that we could actually start staging some of these kids. Could we make an effect if we knew where they were in the staging of their CSWS. So the dormant stage is from the time you're born until the time that you are, you have the start of your seizures. That typically lasts about two years. So around that two to four range, right, we're talking about the start of your epilepsy. Then the prodromal stage, which is epilepsy onset to when you start regress. That's about four years long. 
okay? Then the acute phase, which is regression to seizure freedom. So these are the kids right here who may be diagnosed with Rolandic epilepsy, where we're like, okay, we know something is not quite right here. We see it on the EEG, but yet we may not have gone completely to ESIS yet. We're kind of stuck in the early phases of the ESIS. Then we get the regression that starts, and then now we know where we are. Then regression to seizure freedom, that's about three years on average. And then the residual stage, which is after seizure freedom. The residual stage, really, when we talk about that, it looks very different for the landau Kleffner versus the CSW kids. Because the CSWS kids are the ones who may have much more long-lasting effects, especially cognitively, in comparison to the kids with landau Kleffner. The duration of seizure activity is basically the prodromal stage plus your acute stage. So if you're looking at that, that's a huge percentage of a young kid's life, right? We're talking about seven years of their life. The worst part is we're talking about that time when they're in school. This is basically all of elementary school and into middle school that we're talking about. These are key times that we need to be learning, growing, condensing our memory, learning how to read, learning how to write, learning how to read for content, all these things that are happening that are getting disrupted. The median age at follow-up in this study was 11 and a half years. They followed one kid as long and up until they were 20. Um, and eight patients were still taking anticonvulsants. Um, and what that tells us is that there is still something residual because originally ESIS was thought to end. Oh, you grow out of it just like you do the Rolandic epilepsies. It should be gone by the time you're 11 or 12, 13. But we know now that's not really true because a lot of these kids are having longer lasting effects from it. Um, and all had some degree of neurocognitive deficits after, and that was all the CSWS kids. Yes, please. Most of the kids still had abnormal EEGs, so they were never ever taken completely off of medication due to the risk of seizures. Yeah. And neurocognitively, that actually is a huge question, right? Is are we doing some of these kids a bit of a disservice? Because you may be on a medicine. Um, I think everybody here has probably heard of topiramate. You guys know what the what kind of the nickname of topiramate is? Dopamax, right? Because it makes you feel stupid. Um, yeah. So what are, are we maybe catching some of those kids in a neurocognitive regression where maybe it's the medicine's fault too, and not so much their own fault that the or the fault of the ESIS, but also too that we have them still on medicines that aren't helping any. So most of those kids are taken off of medicine, yeah. So we will not talk about that specifically because most of them are in those landau Kleffner kids, right, where we know that most of them are going to outgrow it in that 12 to 13 year range. If they have a normal EEG, most people, the standard of practice in epilepsy is two years seizure-free on meds with a clean EEG. We're probably happy to take you off meds. Wow. Yeah. All right, so we talked about what's the controversy? Huge controversy surrounding autism. Right? And the reason we talk about this is because this is one of the other kind of hallmark regressive disorders, right? You had a kid who was progressing normally and all of a sudden they weren't anymore. So what happened in there? We see language regression and autism is typically younger. So these are kids that are before 24 months of age. Or maybe they never really learned to talk. They got a couple of words and now they don't use them anymore. As opposed to our ESIS kids, who are kids who have fully formed language development, they were clearly talking, clearly learning and growing, and all of a sudden they weren't anymore. So Something happened. Um, some of them, it's that they're losing words and they'll tell you it starts with word finding problems. That's usually more in the older kids that they recognize that. Parents can recognize it in kids that they can't quite name what they want anymore, even though they know what they want. Um, a lot of them will also have slurred speech, um, and that is also different from autism, where autism, they just don't, won't really talk at all, as opposed to these kids are trying and it's not coming out right. Um, they're not able to put those sentences together in the same way that they were before. 30% of kids with autism um, have regression, and 20% of these have been found to have epileptiform EEGs. So this is one of the big areas of research in epilepsy and autism, right, is talking about what is the link between these two. We know that kids with autism are more likely to have epilepsy, and we know that some of the kids with autism have ESIS. The most important thing is, though, um, is talking about autistic regression and the epileptiform EEG. Most of these kids regressed before we ever found anything on their EEG. So the ESIS started 
after the regression. So we believe they are true, true, and unrelated in the sense that, sure, they're all neurologic. Yes, we know that it's not helping, but it wasn't the ESAs that caused the regression. So it's a bit of a distinction there for us. And the controversy is really because of the age of onset, the clinical phenotype, and the EEG findings. Typically in our autistic kids, they may have abnormal EEGs, but it's usually not ESAs that we're finding. We're finding focal abnormalities or generalized spikes, but not like this. Epilepsy and autism, just to kind of cover that really quickly, it's complicated due to the timing of onset and diagnosis. Um, one study showed when 10 patients, which I know is not that many, um, and that's part of the problem too, is we don't have a lot of data in this because uh, first off, right, we're talking about something that only makes up a half a percent of kids with epilepsy. And then on top of that, then we're adding autism into that too. And so the numbers are just so small for us to deal with. Um, we don't really see the CSWS kids with autism and regression, that specific autistic regression of, wow, we were able to see that and then it looks just like autism, it tends to look different. Um, typically when we look at our kids with autism, they have spike and wave discharges that are found after their regression. Um, and they may not, we have not been able to show a link between the discharges and the regression. Questions, good, okay. Let's talk some about treatment, okay? So treatment, is also complicated. I know, isn't this fun coming to epilepsy conferences and having us tell you, we don't really know. So we focus on minimizing, we focus on minimizing clinical seizures. That's where it all starts, right? Can we stop you from having the clinical seizures? On top of that, in ESIS, we want to stop the abnormal discharges, right? So it's a bit of a twofer that we're trying to get. Um, we cannot, we have not yet found one AED that seems to be better than any others. That is our biggest problem, and that's anti-epileptic drug. Um, you'll see I'll hear them called anti-seizure medicines. That also changes about every three years. And relapse is really, really common. So a lot of these kids are on polypharmacy. They have tried a lot of meds, and they are on a lot of meds. The first line treatments, and these are pretty well kind of agreed upon, um, is valproate. That is the, an oldie but a goodie. You will see in a lot of the research that they talk about valproate only at night. Um, and part of that is because, right, that's such a high burden at night. But for some of those kids who are having seizures during the day as well, we're talking about using it twice a day, but maybe higher at night than in the morning. Ethosuximide um, has been a big one that was used. And I think part of the reason that that one is on this list is because so many of the kids are diagnosed with absence epilepsy early on and then we find out it actually wasn't absence epilepsy because if you come into your neurologist's office, we get a routine EEG, we see generalized spikes, we tell you we know what you got, right? Um, and that's one of the parts where we're not as good because kids tend to not fall asleep in those. I personally, and actually uh, one of my EEG techs is here with me, she can tell you I love a 24 hour study. Um, and the reason is, is because I don't know what's happening at night if I haven't looked. Um, and so that's really important. High dose benzos, specifically Valium, um, was probably the most one that we use. And so that's diazepam, and it's specifically high dose at night. This was another very kind of first line old treatment that we use for a very long time. The problem with this is that Valium doesn't tend to last the kids the entire night. So sometimes parents are having to get up and give it to them again. Also, too, we've now given your kid a big benzo, and I need them to get up in the morning and go to school. It's a whole other complicating factor. Second line um, is high dose steroids. Steroids are a really, really old treatment uh, for epilepsy and they work really well. The problem is we have no consensus on dosing, no consensus on timing. A lot of kids are getting steroids when they've tried multiple other things. They're in the hospital, they're having a bunch of seizures. We throw high dose steroids at them, things seem to get better. The other problem with steroids is it's not a long term treatment. We don't want kids on steroids for a long time because of the weight gain that comes with it. Parents don't like it because it makes them moody. If you're on it for a long time, it can give you osteoporosis. There are all these other things that we don't want to happen, and we also need your adrenals to keep working, which means that I also can't have you on steroids for a long time. IVIG is probably one of the new ones that's out there. I will tell you from our personal experience, while there is plenty of data to say that it works, oh, and this is intravenous immunoglobulins. Um, so this is really an autoimmune type therapy for it. So what we do is we give you antibodies from other people. They go up, they bind everything. It essentially turns your immune system off temporarily and reboots it. Um, and then ACTH, which is one of the old treatments for infantile spasms. Um, and so these are kind of the ones that now there's a lot more research focused on this. I will say steroids, pretty easy to get covered. ACTH, very, very difficult for us to get covered. IVIG, virtually impossible 
for us to get covered by your insurance. And this is where we do a huge disservice to parents, unfortunately, and to families in general, um, because I can't get things that may work. Um, and we don't know if they're going to work until we try them. But the problem is, is one dose of IVIG costs you a couple thousand dollars, and I don't know about y'all, but I don't have that hanging around. So most people can't even pay for this on their own, even if they wanted to. You will see us tend to avoid a couple medicines um, when, we, when we're using these. Phenobarbital um, is a very, very old medicine. The problem with phenobarbital is there is a very old study that came out years and years and years ago before I was even in practice that said that kids on phenobarbital long term have problems with development. Part of the problem with that study is that there were no normal kids, right, you know, not neurocognitively normal kids who were put on it because there is no parent on the planet that's going to give their kid phenobarbital if they don't need it. So that's part of the problem in that study, right, is that we don't have a good answer for that. Phenytoin, the reason this one's on the list is there is evidence to say that dilantin can make things worse. Same reason carbamazepine's on the list. Is that if you have any of the myoclonic and some of the generalized epilepsies, these can make them worse. You'll hear that with Dravet too, right? This is kind of the list of things we don't use and for the same reason. Yes, ma'am. Ah, clobazam. So the reason it's not on the list is because it hasn't been well studied yet, but absolutely. I use a lot of that in replacement of the high-dose benzos because it's longer acting. Yeah. Oh, right. What are you saying with um, yeah. uh, Trileptol? So Trileptol is not commonly used in ESIS because it's a focal medic medicine. Right. So we're tending to use more of the generalized medicines, and you, so you'll see a lot of those. You'll see Vimpat isn't on the list for the same reason. Um, so all of these are broad-spectrum anticonvulsants, so meaning that they are ones that are going to cover multiple seizure types, so really good for generalized seizures typically, and not as good for the focal seizures. I'm wondering more yeah. about uh, Trileptol triggering ESES. Ah, so yes. that we have never shown, but we do know it can make things worse sometimes, yeah. And that's actually true for all anticonvulsants, right? Certain kids, especially with the genetic components of it, you can actually be worse. So some of the sodium channel uh, mutations can actually get worse with certain medications. And that's the reason these guys are on the list, right? It's because of the sodium channel mutations. Yes? Have you guys done any, if you've used or done any studies on um, off-label drugs such as anastine? So there aren't any good ones in ESES, but there are for like Linux Gasto and some of the other... Um, uh, genetic epilepsies as well, yeah. Um, I will say that's usually a last line one, um, but it's definitely on the list for us to use, yeah. And the interesting thing about amantadine too is that we know it can help neuronal support in other ways, and so there's actually some evidence talking about how it can help you cognitively too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so oftentimes these things are kind of getting onto the list because we're like, well, you know, if you've tried 12 things, well, I'm down to try whatever. I always tell everybody, I'm willing to try anything, as long as you're willing to try it with me. I'll try anything. Um, we do know that there's one series of 44 kids with ESIS um, where they looked at seizure frequency and neurocognitive functioning um, and that the long-term remission rates um, and that pro they used actually prolonged steroids in these kids for 21 months, um, which is longer than I have ever in my life had a child on steroids. Um, and I will say the results were decent, um, but in my mind not good enough to make me want to use it for 21 months. All right. The therapy um, is also changing with time, too, right? And so we're talking about structural etiologies. So remember, we talked about that, that early study, right, that said, oh, no, we didn't find anything neuroimaging-wise. Well, the newer studies that are coming out are saying, gosh, maybe there is something else going on. Um, in this study here, we saw 43% um, who had a structural etiology and 20, almost 23% um, in the genetic etiology. My favorite part about this study is they actually broke it down because it was, a, I think this one was a 10-year study, uh, and they broke it down over the course of that 10 years, and it's all the kids at the end who had the genetic etiologies. Why? Our genetic testing has gotten so much better. Um, when I first started my training, which was about 10 years ago, we had about 180 genes on the Invitae Epilepsy gene panel, the one that is done through the NIH, um, through behind the, behind the seizure. Um, and then now we are up to 302, and we just got an email that they're bumping it up to 306. Um, so slowly but surely, we are just adding constantly. Um, and because of that, we're learning more and more and more. And I think you're going to start to see a lot of these kids with ESIS who probably have genetics. Um, as part of the component of it. 
On average, um, the patients received five different types of treatment. Um, so these are five different anticonvulsions, uh, five different types of you know, steroids, getting in the hospital, comas, all those things. We'll talk about coma in a second. Um, and oh, still 70% of them were refractory. What we know is this is a really, really difficult epilepsy to treat. Um, steroids and neurosurgery were the most effective treatments. We're going to talk about surgery in just a second. And what they saw, and this was important, we were talking about the CSWS and the near CSWS kids, is we started condensing them because what we were seeing in all of these when we were really counting, and if you count the way you're supposed to, what you're supposed to do, I was taught, you go first five minutes of every hour that they fall asleep and you count how many spikes you see. You literally make marks on a paper for every single second that you see a spike. It takes you forever, but a lot of the kids are falling into this category, and I find it hard to believe that a kid with 75% looks very different from a kid with 85% involvement of their sleep. And that's what we know now, too. There wasn't a difference, and lots of the studies have that line in it. There was no difference based on it, and now that's why we don't use that as that benchmark anymore. And you'll see it'll say dramatic or significant increase when the kid falls asleep. And there's a sense you get. When we looked at providers, so um, the American Epilepsy Society actually did this, a 24-question study, um, talking about what would you pick if you had a kid with ESIS, or an adult. Um, and that was actually really interesting, because the vary was not based on how old or how long someone had been in practice, but we saw more variety in did you treat kids versus did you treat adults. Um, and that makes sense, right? Because we're the ones who are seeing it in pediatric neurology, not in the adult population. Um, the questions were addressing your treatments to choices based on a clinical scenario. So they gave you a kind of a kid, what does this kid look like? What, is their, what are their seizures like? What would you pick? Um, they had three, 230 um, that were completed, and the first choices were high-dose benzos with diazepam being the most common. There is some debate on whether or not you load the kids. Um, this often happens in the hospital where we do high-dose for a handful of days and then drop them down to something that they'll tolerate a little bit better at home. Valproate, um, corticosteroids, and usually we were doing two milligrams per kilo per day. So if you've ever looked at some of the, I'm sure all you guys in your free time do like I do and read studies about autoimmune stuff, but this is the dosing if you had MS and went into a hospital and had multiple sclerosis, that's the dosing we're giving you. This is very high dose and then they tapered it off. Um, and then Keppra, which interestingly enough, most of the studies don't mention Keppra, this one did. Um, then we saw the endpoints and they talked about what were people's endpoints in treatment. Um, and I will say I like to hit all of these. How did you respond to it in terms of your EEG? Does your EEG look better? But for me, the most important point is how does the kid look? Does the child look better? Are they in school? Are they functioning? Are they doing all the things I need them to do where they are happy and healthy? And if the answer to that is yes, I kind of don't care what their EEG looks like because that's the most important part. But have we done what better cognitively and have we reduced their seizures? And then that's what we talked about, about the consistency against responders. Essentially, pediatricians were all in agreement Adult people were all in agreement, um, and the pediatricians are the ones who are seeing it, so I guess it's good we all agree. The ketogenic diet, um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. It is a high-fat, low-carb diet. Um, it is similar to the Atkins diet. Now we will also use the modified Atkins diet in kids. I will tell you, the ketogenic diet for, for my patient population is very, very difficult. If you have a kid who is G-tube fed, by all means, the ketogenic diet is genius, right? It comes with formulas, you just mix it up, it's all good. But if you have a kid who goes to school, you now have a child who can't have cupcakes, who can't have cookies, who can't have anything. I have one patient who used to come into the hospital all the time out of ketosis. We could never figure out why he was going out of ketosis because his parents were so regimented in it. What we finally found out after like his third or fourth admission where he had come out of ketosis, his older sisters felt badly and would periodically give him cookies and then he would kick out of ketosis. And it was like the most heartbreaking thing to have to explain to these young girls why they can't give their brother something he wants, right? And so this is really hard in fully functional kids. Um, these are seen in kids who are refractory to their anticonvulsants. Um, in one study, now granted, this is even smaller, five kids, um, one had complete cessation, one was a partial responder, and three had no response. This is really true for most of these kids. So part of the problem with this, too, is we're talking about treating refractory epilepsy. And when you're treating refractory epilepsy, the people who are in these categories are already in a category that means that we're probably not going to be able to do a very good job, no matter how hard we try. There are lots of surgical options now. These are mostly have been focused on kids with known lesional causes. So your tuberous sclerosis kids, your neurofibromatosis kids, the ones that we know, oh, you have a cortical dysplasia. Ah, you have a heterotopia. I know what I'm going for. 
But what we've seen is that there are now options that are not in that category. Um, Subpeel transections, this is an old school thing, but we are still doing it. Essentially what we do, we go underneath the dura, and it is, looks like a, almost like a wire cutter, and they actually go in underneath all the coverings of the brain, and they just make these quick little slices. So what you're doing is you're disrupting some of the connections, but not all of them. Um, and so what you do then is you force the neurons to reconnect so that you hopefully, fingers crossed, get rid of the aberrant networks that are causing the seizures and causing the epileptiform discharges, but not disrupting cognition as much. So in your, your kids who are less affected cognitively by it, that may be an, uh, an option. Then focal resection, um, when we go down to the, to the bigger ones, you're talking, talking corpus callosotomies and hemispherectomies. So these are when we are actually going and disconnecting the two sides of the brain so that they can't talk to each other well anymore. Sometimes that can actually help us clarify where the exact problem is, because especially between the frontal lobes, the frontal lobes are so good at talking to each other and talk so rapidly that we sometimes cannot tell where things are coming from, even with depth lectures in. We get better when their depth's in, but it's not perfect. This allows us sometimes to know exactly where things are because you can tell which side is really running the show because the other side may just be along for the ride. Various case series have been, um, have been done, um, and really we're seeing improvements with some of these surgical things in both neurocognitive outcomes and seizure burden, which is always our goal. They, there is a study at the University of Wisconsin looking specifically at focal resection. Um, most of these kids had perinatal injuries, meaning that these are strokes that happened when they were in utero or right when they were born. Um, and they actually had two patients in this study with normal MRIs, which I find fascinating, um, because they did focal resections on kids where we didn't know exactly what we were going for, but they used imaging from other other man, um, manners, so PET scans, spec scans, um, and MEGS, so that we have found a focal lesion, but we can't see it, but we know where we're going. Um, because everything in that region, so PET scans and spec scans are looking at the movement of, a, of glucose, looking at the movement of water, and using those to figure out, is there a part of the brain that's using more or less than it should be, which can tell us that part of it isn't working properly. MEGS are actually looking at, it's a combination of an, essentially of an EEG and an MRI, and what we do is using magnetic imaging, we then say this is was when a spike happened, this is when a spike happened, this is when a spike happened, and then it pinpoints where the problem is based on the movement and the change in the polarization of those molecules, which is actually really, really, really cool. Most of the kids had, um, so all of them had cognitive decline in this study, and we were doing surgery really to try to stop that. 10 out of the 14 had hemispherotomies. So these are kids who are completely disconnected. Um, one had a temporoparietal occipital disconnection. So what we're talking there, that's gonna be like a callosotomy, more like that. Um, one had a frontal surgery, I'm sorry, a frontal lobectomy. And one had a, a very specific resection, um, and one had a limited corchectomy. So these are just different varying types. What we saw is that 12 had good seizure outcomes, right? And then, and this is very similar to what you'll see in like the LGS data um, when we talk about hemispherotomies, um, and then, and callosotomies too. ESAs resolved at three years in follow-up in 12 of them, which is awesome. So we did something good. We broke something there. And I think we need to be talking more and looking more at these things for these kids. This is the neurocognitive data from their studies. And so if you look, really these bottom three are the ones to look at. After surgery, before surgery, how they did. And what you're seeing is these kids got better. Wasn't huge, but they got better. And that's the important part. There's newer stuff coming out with transcranial stimulation. Um, there is, I will say, there's not a lot of data on VNS, RNS, or deep brain stimulation at this point, but this is one of the things that has been studied. What it's doing is changing your neuronal discharges. That's what we know from animal models. Um, you do stimulation at one milliamp is what most children can tolerate. Most kids can't tolerate much more than that because it's uncomfortable. Um, they only had two kids in this study with ESAs, and they did demonstrate large reductions in their epileptiform discharges. I don't know who has it right now, but there are a handful of centers that do, but it's only a handful, and you have to find typically an adult person who's willing to do it on a child. Yeah. 
We also are doing pharmacologically induced comas. So this you will hear too when kids come in in status. Uh, the way I like to describe this for parents and kind of what my goal is when I'm doing um, a medication induced coma is like when you hard restart your computer, right? You push the button, you wait for everything to turn off, you wait for a second, and if you do like the, you know, AT&T tells you, you count to 15, if you're like me, I wait like three seconds and I push it back on and hope for the best. In this, we are essentially using medication to completely drop your brain function down to its most primitive. We are getting silence and then bursting, silence and bursting, and that's the goal. And then we slowly bring you back out of it. This in case reports has been really variable, but it is something that you can use and often is used in coordination with like steroids and stuff like that just to kind of calm everything down when you've gotten a bit out of control. The long-term outcomes are really varied. What we know is that typically the epilepsy will result, but that is not true for all kids. That data is mostly in the Landau-Kleffner kids and not so much in the CSWS kids. Many children are left with permanent impairments, especially in language. Um, again, the CSWS kids are often less left with damage in all aspects, motor function, fine motor function, all of those things, but language for all of these kids takes the biggest hit. And that can be written language too. I think we think of it mostly as spoken language, but for school, right, we're asking kids to read and write too. That may be where the problem arises. So their speaking may come back to totally normal, but what we know is, gosh, the things they were really good at before, they're not as good at now. Um, we know the longer that the ESIS goes, the worse off things are, um, and it is a predictor of poor prognosis. Meaning, if we are having more and more trouble and you are going into that like seven, eight years, it's constantly coming back. We have a lot of kids, the girl I was telling you about with the card, um, she has frequently come in and out of hers, right? We know that cognitively, that is gonna take a big hit on your brain. And part of that is because what we're aiming for when you're sleeping is all of that consolidation of your networks and you're getting aberrant synaptic formation because there's these firings that are constantly happening and not allowing you to make the connections you should be. And so that's, you know, that's part of where we are with all of that. Um, natural history suggests that the clinical seizures should cease around puberty, um, but that doesn't mean you're not having electrographic seizures. Um, and then two, we know that the electrographic um, ACES often gets better, but can then look more like a Linux Gasto kid in those settings where even though you may not be seizing as much as you were before, it doesn't mean that your EEG looks normal anymore. And that's all I got. And I will tell you, this is a very personal thing for me, too. Um, when, I, when you guys saw this picture up here of my dogs, oh, you can't see it. Hold on. I have to stop my PowerPoint. Hold that thought. Yes, please. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of really varied data on that. Most of our kids are in speech therapy of some sort, and there is some data to say that maybe it's because of the receptive component of the language that if you could hone in on making those differences a little bit more obvious, would it be easier for your brain? Um, I think the answer to that is maybe. Um, anything we can do to help these kids, I think it's worth it. Um, if it helps them, great. If it doesn't and they hate wearing them, probably not the fight to take. Yeah, but just so you know, this is, this is my dog Torres. Um, he has epilepsy, he's on zonisamide twice a day. Um, I did not get him knowing he had epilepsy. Uh, I adopted him at six weeks old as a foster. Um, he had his first seizure at four months and I will tell you, um, for 43 seconds I was terrified. And I figured no one else knows better than I do what to do and I was terrified. Um, and all I kept thinking was why don't I have a bulb suction? Well, I don't have a bulb suction because I don't have children. And then, yeah, eh, it was so, I, I feel you in those moments. I know what that feels like. Yes. So we don't do enough, uh, that is a great question. We don't do enough EEGs in dogs to know whether or not they can have ESES, but we do know that absolutely dogs can have these high spike burdens, high seizure burdens, and you gotta figure some of those animals are not, you know, you'll hear us say, if you have a brain, it can seize, and that is true. If you have even, we see kids with just bad, you know, anoxic brain injuries um, and things like that where huge portions of their brain have been taken out by injury and yet they have enough neurons to seize. Dogs definitely have enough neurons to seize. They tend to look more like lgs -E than they do like the ESIS kids, but we absolutely see, see dogs that look like, gosh, they used to be able to do things and now they can't, what happened? Yeah. 
Yeah. We know dogs can get demented too. And they get sundowning and stuff just like adults do. Yes? So is, you know, like um, tooth, tooth grinding, mm -hmm. is that a sign like of activity happening in sleep? So not necessarily, but it's important if you're seeing it change and you're like, gosh, you know, something has changed about the way that we're sleeping, how we're waking up in the morning. Teeth grinding can be very normal. In the autistic kids, we often see a lot of teeth grinding. Um, and so that's where it gets a little bit complicated. Is, is it just a component of your sleep that's actually very normal or is it not? Uh, for a lot of those things, I just get an overnight EEG and I answer the question of, yes, we're seizing at night. No, we're not. Yeah. But the only way for us to know is to get an EEG. Yeah. Yes. What are you seeing as the impacts of just stopping treating the spike waves? Like my son, we're still treating focal seizures mm -hmm. the, with Vimpat, and he has a VNS, but that's all we're doing. We've yeah. tried steroids, we've tried benzos, Omphi, Valium. Yeah. yeah. So at some point, I think it also, we have to talk about quality of life. And what's your quality of life like? Um, and I have some kids that when they look down at their hand and they have to take those 10 pills every single day, twice a day, it's not worth it to them. That they're like, so what, I have to go to tutoring twice a week, I'm doing fine in school. And so I think you have to start balancing that stuff too. There aren't any, like in long term, we know the longer your ESIS goes, the more likely you are to have kind of permanent, you know, neurocognitive stuff. Six years now. Yeah, exactly, yes. Exactly, so neurocognitively, we know that it's taking a toll, um, especially because we are not getting that normal um, you know, consolidation, normal learning, normal memory, all those things. So we know that that absolutely takes a toll, but in terms of what that means long term, we don't have great data to say. Mm -hmm. So one of the most important things that you can do is get neuropsychological testing because that is going to highlight what we're really good at. We're all naturally very good at different components of our memory, right? And we, you'll hear this talked about in school, right? Some of us are visual learners, some are verbal learners, some are you know, kinesiogenic learners. What works for your kid and then tailoring everything to the part of their memory that is the strongest for them. And that's what we recommend doing for those kids. And then just repeating over and over and over again. But it is so very, very, very hard. We know that. Ah, yes? When um, they say there's long-term consequences of mm -hmm. ESES. 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 We'll take any of it. Um, is it because of, like, they've missed that learning or is there something else? It tends to be that they've missed the learning. So the really the long term, we're talking neurocognitive. Mm -hmm. that, that it's right. So we're constantly playing catch up. And that's one of the biggest issues we have with kids in general, and especially when it comes, right? So if you're, everybody's on this trajectory, right? Like this. So now I need to get your kid not just from here to here, but here to here, where now all the rest of their, of their peers are, right? And so we're hitting this goal that's still moving constantly, and that's what makes it so hard. But neurocognitively is where they take the biggest hit. Yes. So my kid in particular, uh, found out he was having seizures when he was seven and he told me about it. He'd been having them during sleep, probably had. And then uh, we went through, you know, a million different meds and he landed on three. Mm -hmm. And um, so he's 18 now, hasn't had a seizure in 12 years. Oh. He's doing great. Um, but I want to wean him off the medication. Of course. And I'm told, my one neurologist, don't rock the boat, don't touch it. He may have seizures. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and part of it is because, especially in kids, we have a huge deficit in terms of research. And that's just because we can't get kids to, we can't get parents to do a lot of the studies, which obviously, of course. Um, and the other thing is there's no control groups for most of our kids. So we're doing studies in the kids who are actively having the issues. Most people will say, um, and I would say especially on three meds, if it was my patient, I would do an EEG, and then we, we pick one and we start there. Um, and you do one, you wait a little bit, check again, try another one. Huh. And just slowly see if you can get off something. You start yeah. with the one that's off label, right? Well, yeah, the one that's most expensive. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> ER? Yeah, that'll do it. When you start adding XR, it has a whole nother realm. Yes. <laughs> 
Ah, so, oh, that is, it's Linux Gusto, the shorten is LGS. Right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, between LGS and ESIS? Yeah. Um, so ESIS is specifically at night. LGS um, is that slow spike in waves, so one to two hertz spike in waves that are seen mostly in the frontal region. So it's a difference in the EEGs and how they look to us. Yeah. Yes? So back to the two part waves. Yes. So not necessarily. So some kids will have like automatisms like tooth grinding, grimacing. You'll hear a lot, especially when they're awake, they do like kind of things with their mouths, lip smacking type movements, those types of things. The key is linking the two. Um, and that is probably best done in an EMU setting um, because they'll be able to tell you exactly what's happening when. It's harder on the home studies for us um, because at least in, when I, in my experience, the video isn't as close as it should be. The things just are not exactly as good as I'd like it to be. In an EMU, you're right there with them. So you can tell us when you hear the teeth grinding and we can match it up and see if we see the same thing. Yeah. But sometimes that's the only way to answer it. Yes? Do any of your uh, patients use cannabis? Of course. So, okay, so I am from Texas, and so we actually have a very interesting thing. So I have a ton of kids on Epidiolex, um, and then we actually have Compassionate Cultivation, which is state-monitored CBD with THC. So yes, we have a bunch of kids on that. Have you found that any of your patients have CBN helps them So what we tend to find is that when we've had kids who switched from CBD with THC through compassionate cultivation and then moved to Epidiolex, that they needed a bit of the THC component for sleep. So we had a lot of kids who added back in THC. And we actually now have a zero to one formulation that's only THC where they get no CBD with it. And we are using that actually heavily in our autistic population as well. And the THC component of it, it's really interesting when you look at the data coming out of the uh, um, psychology and psychiatry, um, anxiety, depression, those tend to respond better to the THC component than they do to the CBD component. So we know that both of them are in there. The thing is, is that they're going at different receptors and they actually bind to the receptors differently. So it changes the way that then those neurons are responding to even what you're taking. So we absolutely know that the different types seem to be doing different things. Yeah, and can absolutely help. We have lots of kids on all variations of CBD, THC, all ratios of CBD and THC. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So absolutely. And so all of us have, if you have epilepsy, your likelihood, we actually have like a small subset of kids and they're kind of like special because they look worse when they're awake than they do when they're asleep. And that's very rare. Most people look worse when they're asleep than they do when they're awake. Um, and so absolutely we know that things at night disrupt things um, because that's when so much of our consolidation happens. Memory, learning, all that stuff happens at night. And two, when we dream, right? What, what, why do we dream? Right? We dream to kind of give us a context that's safe and secure to kind of work through what we've been thinking about, what our, what our emotions are. All those things are in there together, even if we don't know that that's what's happening. It's this place for our brain to kind of work through scenarios, right? And so we know if that's not happening too, that's going to take a toll on you emotionally. Yeah. Yes? So follow up to the CBD and THC. Yes. Uh, have you had success with that too, with kids who have CSWs and are autistic? The same oh, thing? yeah. Yeah, so we actually have quite a few kids who fall into that category. And a lot of our kids with, and even just epilepsy in general, who are also have autism, um, we saw that a lot of them when they moved over to um, CBD only, of a dialect, right? That then they, we were starting to see behavioral things we hadn't seen before. Um, sleep issues we hadn't seen before. And then we started thinking, okay, what did we take away? Because we all thought, oh, well, we, took, we didn't take away the CBD. What happened? We took away the THC. Right? So we there was something that changed. Epidiolex is next on our list. So maybe, I don't know if that needs to happen with THC too, if we need to add that in. So I would say try one. Out. The nice thing about Epidiolex is uh, they'll pay for it. Um, so insurance will pay for Epidiolex. Um, and that is our, honestly, truthfully, our biggest barrier to compassionate cultivation. It's expensive. Um, and no insurance company on the planet will pay for it because it has THC, which is the component that is you know, regulated um, and not legal in the United States. Yes. Ah, I heard about this. Uh, yes, I was with Brad. Um, yeah. 
so that is the other thing, right, is it's very, very hard for us to kind of explain that to people, um, is that we are doing this, um, I will use another one of my patients, um, ended up in an ER in another state for constipation, um, trying to be very open and honest. Mom told them that they were on compassionate cultivation, and the next thing we know, I'm getting phone calls from CPS. Um, and I was like, you've got to be joking me, because they never would have drug tested if mom hadn't said so. Um, but mom was trying to be honest with them and tell them, like, yeah, this is what I have. And so it is so very, very hard, because in some of these states, right, it's legal in Texas, but I have to tell them, you're not supposed to take it to Louisiana to go visit your family or to wherever. But yet, we know it's helping, and I don't, we don't quite know how to get past that part. There is lying. lying. Well, if you watch House, right, everybody lies. <laughs> No, I had a kid who, who got chased by the drug dogs at school. Yeah. That was super fun, yeah, too. It wasn't, yeah. it just wasn't. And this is in a legal situation, too, right? Like, where they had it and had it legally. So it is. It's complicated, especially in Texas. We, we have a registry in Texas, so all they have to do is go look you up on our registry. But the reality is this is only for the state of Texas, right? And so you go to, you know, Wyoming, and now they're like, well, that's not legal in Wyoming. And what do you mean you're registered in Texas and it's legal there? Right? So it's, it is, it's complicated to say the least. We are trying really, really hard. Um, also the lovely people at Jazz in Greenwich are trying very, very hard. Um, in Europe, THC and CBD are open and we can use them, so work in progress. But yes, we hear that from a lot of families and I'm so very, very sorry, especially because it traumatized you from Disneyland. Yes? Yes. Or is it like if they want to? So we are mandated, most of the states have mandated CME. Um, like in the state of Texas, we have to do a certain amount. Um, it ends up being, if you add up like all the hours, it's about like two and a half days worth. Um, I get mine at AES every single year at the American Epilepsy Society meeting. But yes, we do, by law, we are supposed to keep doing those to keep your uh, license active. But it doesn't say what you have to do in the sense of, you know, like, I mean, as an epilepsy provider, I could go read about autism if that's what I wanted to do that. But so it doesn't mandate what you have to do to keep that active, but you do have to do something. I'm trying to explain yes. why they say such different things. It has a ah, yes. it, it's, it leaves it up to a parent. I literally, with my non-epilepsy education, I have to go, okay, which one sounds better? What should I do? Right. You know? And that's, yeah, and that's not fair. Yeah, and that's what I always say, that's the art part of it too, right? And you are, for us, we are most traumatized by the last thing we just saw. Um, and so if you just did surgery on a kid and it went terribly, I will tell you, your want to take the next kid to surgery is like so very limited because you're, you're also low-key traumatized by it. Um, and so because of that, then I definitely think it changes the way. I will say, and now granted this might be a little jaded because I'm young, but I do think that we are bringing people up to be more open-minded in terms of what we're trying, what we're doing, um, my goal is always, I, part of the reason I love neurology, especially pediatrics, is it's quality of life too. Like I have a lot of quality of life conversations like we were talking about, right? Is it more important that your kid goes to school and has a couple seizures every day than it is that they're completely seizure free? Well, yeah, if that's what they want, then yeah, that's what I want, right? If they wanna go and be able to, you know, run on their track team, great, that's what I want too. Um, and so it is sometimes about talking about that and making that kind of balance between all those things. But that's why, because we're all different. We all think differently. Yes? Have you seen any other, I mean, any kids with DSDS with other organ issues? Like, I've got liver, hepatitis issues, we've got SIDO, we've got hypogammaglobinemia. <laughs> just, every time we go back, we keep finding something wrong on another part of the organ other than just the brain. But have you seen more? We do see that, and we tend to see that in the genetic conditions. Yeah. Um, so if you haven't had genetic testing yet, that is definitely something you should Have you had whole exome sequencing? What? Whole exome sequencing? Yes. Ah. For variants. But yeah. Sure variants, yeah. Um, there are definitely groups. Come talk to me. We'll talk about people to call and look at because there are, there are some people to talk to with that that are doing a really nice job. Yes. Oh, they're telling me my time is up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, guys.